Hey folks, how you doing? We're doing another lessons learned and this is Montana limited entry elk. It was a hunt I went on and I self filmed it all. Uh, and that was a mistake because I'm not very good at filming and I made four other mistakes I'm going to talk about and I did one thing right. And I ended up not filling the tag, even though I could have. So I might even go into a sixth or seventh point in my tangents here about what it could be. But for a limited entry tag, my first mistake was allocate enough time. These tags are special. This one was not that hard to draw. But even at that, it was a pretty decent tag that I can get every three years probably. And what I did, I'm going to say this is a minus. I wasted too much of my time doing other things. I should have prioritized my calendar and given this a week of really hard hunting. Because here's what I did. I went up for three days and the wind just howled. And I got to learn a little bit about what was going on. And I went up for another day and the wind was blowing 60. I just turned around and went home. Then I went up for two more days and the wind howled. So I, I should have combined all those days into one period rather than a little bit here and a little bit there. Because you know how it works. You kind of get a pattern started, maybe figured out, and then got to go home. Kind of like when you're a weekend warrior, right? You weekend warriors, if you guys had five days, six days, you'd be filling a lot more tags because Monday you're really getting it dialed in. Well, I didn't do that. And I kicked myself because the tag deserved better. And yeah, we're traveling. I had multiple other hunts in between this and I was just doing it based on the few days that I had where we weren't out of town. But that's no excuse. So... If you draw a limited entry tag, make it a priority. Give it enough time. And, you know, <laughs> what we do, we travel a lot. So I, I, ha I made the best of what I, I, I had. But back here when I was planning my calendar in August, I could have done a better job and I didn't. So that's on me. Well, you heard me talk about how windy it was, right? Prepare for all conditions every day the wind was 30 or more miles an hour this was the windiest season i've ever hunted in but i'm just going to draw a couple diagrams that you know here's a ridge line that comes down like this and goes over there and the wind was let's say it's coming out of the northwest well a lot of the places that I was hunting and you saw in the footage was mostly up above these timbered areas. So this is timber down here on these sides like this. And when the wind is howling, the elk aren't up here in the open. These, these are kind of open areas. Whereas when it's not really windy, you'll catch them in these their smaller cuts and brush and little drainages and stuff. And you'll catch them in there. But if it's super windy, they go whoom. They want to get out of the wind. And in my e-scouting, here's my flaw. Every place I had on my e-scouting map was a good spot unless the wind is howling. So I go to this spot, and where are all the elk? Occasionally I catch a glimpse of one down here, down in the timber. Well. In Montana, most of this lower country is private. So they were down, getting out of the wind, and you know, over here and over here and over here and over here. And sometimes in the evening, right at last light, they'd come right up in here, but they weren't leaving the protection of the of the trees very much just because of the wind. And I know some would say, well, the wind blows all the time. Well, not all the time. But when the wind blows, and it blows a lot, the elk go find places to get out of it, especially in cold weather. So I did not, go back to my point here, I did not properly prepare for all possible conditions. I should have had, on my e-scouting plan, I should have had one spot that, okay, if there's a ton of snow, this is where I'm going. 
if it's really windy, this is where I'm going. I didn't. I had four spots, general spots, and they were all pretty much the same. And sure enough, we get a really windy season this year, and it made my, my uh, progress a lot harder. And now, how this might apply to you, maybe you live someplace where it doesn't snow or it's not normally windy. My point isn't just wind. When I, I purposely said all conditions. So in your e-scouting, think about spots of, okay, if I have four general areas, basins, elevations, whatever, is at least one of them a good spot if we get a ton of snow? Or is one of them a really good spot if it's really hot? Or if we get a bunch of rain or we get a bunch of wind? have some e-scouting plans in place so that when you show up and you find out that, oh, this is the, the weather, the element conditions, you're not left holding the bag like I, again, this is all on me. This, I could have solved this by doing a better job of e-scouting. This one is, this is me. This, this is just the nature of who I am. You know that I love hunting boundaries, right? Well, at least maybe I should say, give yourself enough public land or accessible land. So how much is enough? I usually say if it's 40%, I'm good. 40% and above, 50% is my preference. I'm gonna wipe this off. And I'm going to draw another diagram here, so bear with me. So you're probably looking at my little grid line and saying, what is this? If you've ever looked at a surface map, and sometimes these are section lines, right? And so it starts with section one, it goes this way, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, da, 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 down to 36. Well, sometimes you have this one here is, the blue ones are the ones that are accessible. And you get a checkerboard pattern like this, all right? And so if it's 50% public and it's all in a checkerboard, it's like, hmm, that could be tough. But every once in a while you might get, okay, I only have 30% public, but guess what? It's all in one block of property. Well, right here we've got nine sections out of 36. So one fourth of it is public, but it's all blocked up. So I can make a hunt out of that. But sometimes you get, okay, a little bit over here and a little bit over here and a little bit over here. And you don't have much to work with. And so you're constantly chasing these boundaries. Let's see if I can do this. And this is how it was there. This is private, this is public, and then I ended up with another piece that came in like this, and then over here I got a piece, and then I, it goes like that. So this is all private. And where does the elk show up? There's these ridges that come, there's a high ridge here. And there's these ridges that are coming down like this and coming over this way and this way. The elk were coming choo, 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 and they were hanging right on these edges. Sometimes they'd be slightly into public. And uh, there was one ridge that kind of transected here like that. And one time I did catch elk there. But my point of this is, give yourself enough public land to hunt effectively. I boxed myself in here way too much because the contour also, the uh, weird contour lines, there was a trail that went like this, and this is all public, and it hits this private right here. So I had to make this big jog and drop way down in this drainage 
to get around that private and then come back up here where the trail came back through like this. I'd not hunted some of these spots before. I didn't realize the elk would hang that tight to the private. I should have known that because this was public land. It had been logged pretty heavily. It was okay, but the better habitat was in a few spots here on private. I, I look at all this and I'm, I'm doing my e-scouting. I'm like, well, they'll be moving across here and I'll have a chance, because this is about a mile this way, about a mile and a half that way, mile that way. I thought, you know what, they gotta move across some of that stuff. I'll get my chances. Well, if you watch the video, the chance I had is I had a glassing knob way over here, and uh, I did see a really nice bull right here. I saw him twice, but, by the time I would go this two and a half or whatever miles and have to jog all this land, he would go right back over here and he'd bed over there. And then one day I saw like, I think five of them and right at daylight they were right here. And they went over here and they bedded right there. And uh, so... It was a good place, it was probably a good strategy, but I didn't give myself enough public land to work with. Now, if my glassing knob would have been over here, then maybe I could have still made a play on some of these before they got to private. But then I still would have had to deal with the idea of, well, if, if I would have shot this one right here, and there's a little ridge line that I drew that kind of wrong, uh, it more went like this. He would be on this ridge line. If I shot, as quick as he trotted down off that ridge, he's on private. And so I wanted him to be way out here. Never happened. So give yourself at least enough ground to work with when you're doing your e-scouting. Uh, I didn't and uh, ended up paying the price for it because one thing... It looks like one thing when you're e-scouting and then you get out there and it's like, hmm, this is different than it looked like on aerial maps. Well, I paid the price. Lesson learned, right? So far, I've got three negatives on this hunt. And if you saw the last day, uh, this is, I'm still kicking myself over this one. Hunt for your own reasons. And you might say, what's that mean, Randy? Well, I got out of here and I'm, I'll pull my diagram over here again. I'm over here and I'm glassing, doing some of this stuff every day and I'm thinking, well, you know, I've seen this really nice one. I've built a little bit of storyline around this one. I'm, I'm going to wait that one out. And the last evening, I come and make this trek, and I get right here. And uh, I, I know I can get over here in about 15 or 20 minutes. So I'm sitting right here, and out comes three really nice bulls right out in here. I mean, they're, they're well into public. But it's a raghorn, a five point, and a small six point. And here's what's going through my head. And I'm, I'm trying to make the analogy or the parallel where maybe you have expectations put on you that you've cooked up yourself. That, oh, I wonder what my hunting friends will think. Or I wonder what, what, what will people think if I do this or do that. I got the... I'm sitting right here and these three come out and they're on public and I have about an hour of time and I've I got to go down this steep ridge and come up this steep ridge but I could have got there and killed one of those and so here's here's what was going through my mind and this is why you should hunt for your own reasons and not worry about others I got to thinking well what's the audience gonna think if I give up on this one and just hurry over here and shoot one, are they gonna say, oh, he just felt like he had to fill a tag? Well, 
then I got myself into this like spiral of, well, then if I don't go there, people are going to say, oh, he's trophy hunting. And I got myself in a really stupid space. Just mentally, I, I screwed myself up. So I wait a little longer, wait a little longer. I realize this bull is probably not going to come out. And finally, I take off over here. And what do these three bulls do? They pick up and they go, boop. And right about there, I, I get there and I film them. And now I realize I screwed up. Because Randy Newberg, if he hadn't talked himself into some stupid expectation or worrying about what others were going to think, the second these three bulls showed up, I would have been like, boom, boom. And I would have killed one of them. I had my chance right there. I've been hunting for this whole period of time and, you know, I get a gift. And what do I do? I sit here and, uh, oh, what will people think? What will the audience think? Well, I know even before I started filming content, I used to at times get myself, well, I wonder what my friends will think. I wonder what, you know, what, you know, what will I think about this a month from now? And sometimes you can get your brain in just a stupid place. And I do it plenty of times. And this is a perfect example. I still, here it is February. This happened uh, middle of November. I'm still mad at myself. Because if I would have just followed my gut and did what I do, I would have said, you know what? I don't need to shoot the biggest bull in the unit. I'm more than happy with a raghorn or a five point or a small six point. Let's go get one. And they, they stayed out here for probably 40 minutes before they started easing away. And it wasn't until they started moving away that I decided I better go. Too late by then. So. The point of all of that is, hunting should be about your reasons. It's not about what your buddies think or what your family thinks or what you're gonna second guess a week from now or a, a year from now. Do what your gut tells you. Go with just, you know, whatever makes you smile. Whatever is in your gut, go do that. Don't overthink it. I'm. That's probably the most disappointing thing I feel like I've done in four or five years is let my mind get in such a stupid place. So it's not really a tactic or a strategy negative. It's a mental, it, it's the human component negative is what that is. It's, it's your own head game that you got going on. So, but there's never a hunt that is all negatives. So, I get to put a positive up here for number five. Know the season you are hunting. Let me wipe my board off again. Jonathan, what's that guy, the Bob Ross, is that his name? Maybe I should be like the Bob Ross of hunting diagram. I don't think anyone's going to confuse me with Bob Ross. So, you've seen me do this, I don't know how many times, early, uh, pre-rut, peak rut, post-rut, late season. So, when was I hunting? The first time I went out there, I was at the end of the post rut. The second time I went, when I really had a plan dialed in, I was out here in the late season. And I know that late season is sanctuary mode. I say this is November 1 until the end of the season. Well, this was November probably 15th, something like that. So I'm well into the late season period. And by knowing what season I'm hunting, in this case, late season, I knew the type of places these elk were going to be. 
And I did encounter my share of elk. It's just like I said back here, I didn't give myself enough public and private. So the very first thing you need to do when you do your e-scouting is go and say, all right, what time of year is it? For me, early is August. This is September 1 through about the 10th, plus or minus, you know. And this is the 11th, plus or minus a couple days to, I usually go till about August, I don't know, let's say 8th, plus or minus a couple days. Here this is, uh, this say August, I'm in October. Uh, again, these all vary slightly to 10.31. So, the very first thing you need to do when you're planning your trip in e-scouting is to determine which of these five calendar periods am I hunting? Because the needs are what drive the location. So, needs equal location. In other words, where are you going to find them? That's the where. The needs are why you will find them there. Okay, so I know in the late season, it's sanctuary. They want to get away from things. That's what it is in late season. Now, pre-rut, they're looking for cows. Peak rut, they're looking for cows. Early season, they're looking for food. So if the need, in this case sanctuary, is places that are far away or hard and complicated to hike through, or maybe have so much private land that people give up on it and therefore elk go there because there's less hunting pressure. A sanctuary is any place where hunting pressure is less. And that can be terrain, topography, distance, uh, boundaries, whatever. So if I want to know where, that's going to be determined by the why. In other words, what do they need? And there's four needs. Food, water, sanctuary, and seasonally, sometimes, breeding. So you got to determine which of these four needs they want at the time of year you're hunting them because their location in November is way different than what it's going to be in August or in late October, way different than early September. So I think I did the right thing. I'll give myself some points for that. I knew I was in a late season pattern. I knew the bulls were going to be in places that had less hunting pressure. And the places that create less hunting pressure in this case were spots where I had to walk a couple miles just to get to my glassing hill. And then from there, I had to walk a couple more miles to maybe get where the elk were. And there was enough of this weird private public interface that I never saw another hunter in there. I saw way more elk than I did hunters. So I would say these are the lessons, the main lessons that I learned in this hunt that again, they'll stick with me. I'll, I'll be thinking about that. In fact, if you asked our crew right now, what was the first thing I said when we did our year end meetings for planning the 2021 season? is let's not spread ourselves so thin. Let's do fewer hunts and give it more of an effort. And that all comes back to me realizing my, the way I designed our calendar in 2020 did not allow me to allocate enough time. And then all this other stuff, these are just mental notes. It's like, yeah, don't do that again, Randy. So anyhow, I hope that you get some benefit out of these. You know, I, I'm embarrassed to have to stand here and tell you in a hunt, the five lessons, four of them are negative, but it doesn't always go the way you want. If I would have shot one of those three bulls that last evening, this would have been a positive because I would have said hunt for your own reasons. And I went and I shot that five point or whatever, and that would have been a positive, but I didn't do it. So anyhow, the idea is for you to benefit from our mistakes or benefit from the things we do right. 
we don't have it all figured out as, <laughs> as you can see by how many negatives I have here. But we're not here to act like we're the greatest hunters in the world. We're just here to analyze what we did right and what we did wrong and share that with all of you. Thanks for watching.